We're going to move on to our main presentation. I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, uh, Mike KA4CDN is going to talk to us about the SimSmith tool and hopefully remind us a little bit about uh, Smith charts. Um, and uh, he's been working real hard on this presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, so um, this is going to be an introduction to an application called uh, SimSmith. So what I'm going to do here, SimSmith is a, it's a, it's a free program that can help us understand what impedances are. And it can also help us understand and learn a little bit about Smith charts. So if you don't know anything about Smith charts itself, hopefully this application will give you a better intuitive feel for uh, what Smith charts are and how they help us visualize and solve many of our matching problems that we might encounter. So for my presentation here, I'm going to give a quick review. Perhaps it's an introduction to some basic concepts, such as impedance, what it is, how all components have some form of impedance, um, how we represent uh, impedances on a rectangular form, a plot, and then uh, some, some real basics on Smith charts themselves. So that section, this review, overview, I'm going to go really fast through this. Um, and just to give you sort of a, a base of what SimSmith then is, is built on and what it can do for us. So the main focus is going to be on the application itself. And I've got a little short three-minute introduction by the author himself, a YouTube video. So I'll play that. And then I go on to show some of the fundamental pieces of the, of the program. And then the main focus will be on impedance matching, how we can do various forms of impedance matching, be it coax stubs or lump components. And then a few other nifty little tricks that we'll find really helpful, um, such as translating um, your impedance that you measure in your shack out to what the feed point impedance is. And then what well, might be really interesting for field day is evaluating some coax stubs. So hopefully there'll be something in here that everybody will find somewhat of interest. Okay, so starting diving right into some basics here, impedance. So as a review, impedance is composed of both a resistance and a reactance. So you can think of resistance as the friction against the current flow. And your basic form is a resistor itself, is a, is, can be a pure resistance. And reactance is the inertia against the change in current flow. So think about an inductor or a capacitor. They want to oppose any change in current flow. And the way you represent an impedance is with a complex number. And so you'll see there it's R plus or minus JX, where R is a resistance part and X is representing the impedance value. And J is, um, they call it imaginary because you can't have a square root of a minus one. So that, that's where the term imaginary comes from. So here are some examples of uh, a pure resistance. Is fit, whoa. 50 ohms plus no reactants. And then here's one, 200 plus a little capacitive reactants. And here's one with some inductive reactants. Um, resistance can never be negative. Reactants can be negative. In that case, if it's negative, then it re represents a capacitive load. And a positive reactants represents an inductive load. So the key to take away from some of this is that any, any device out there is going to have some resistance and some reactance. Even like a pure resistor, if you looked at it closely enough, will have some inductance probably built into it. Um, if you're standing there and you're holding your handy talking, if you can measure your body to relative to ground, you're going to have resistance to the ground. You're going to have capacitance to ground. So everything out there will have some resistance and some reactance, so impedance. So here's just an example. So here's a resistor. It's, um, and so these are I ideal devices. So an ideal resistor will have X equals zero. And so the impedance is written, in this case, this is a 100 ohm resistor. So 100 plus no reactance, J is zero. A, a pure inductor will have no resistance. The reactance is measured in ohms as well. That's the unit, ohms. The, the reactance is based on a frequency also. So inductors will change with the frequency. So in this case, we have zero resistance and J is 100. The capacitor is J minus 100. And again, ideally, no resistance. 
So if you wanted to plot a, res- a impedance on a rectangular graph, and you've probably seen this, this is a basic question on a lot of the amateur tests. You have a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system here where you have a axis with R for the resistance. You'll never have anything over in these two quadrants because R can never be negative. On the x-axis here, or this is the y-axis, but it represents the impedance. Positive will be inductors, and capacitors will be negative down here. So all our points for capacitive loads will be down in this region. Inductive region will be up in here. And here's another depiction of the same thing, a coordinate system showing you've got x's, capacitance down here, inductors up here. Uh, this is showing a ideal, a non-idealized inductor where it has resistance. So it'll be up in this quadrant and you'll have um, capacitive down in this quadrant. Now I'm showing all this because it seems a little overwhelming and <laughs> hopefully when we get through this introduction and the basics here, you're going to see how Smith chart simplifies all this stuff quite a bit. Okay, one other thing to note here is so we have the inverse of impedance is something called admittance. And admittance, just like impedance is composed of resistance and reactance, impedance is composed of conductance and subsistence. And it's represented just like impedance is as a complex number, G plus or minus JL. So take a deep breath and look at this for a second. I'm just going to go right on past this. <laughs> um, series components are simply, if you want to add them up, if they're in series, you just add up their impedances. It's really, really easy to do. So you think of a couple of resistors in series, right? 100 ohm resistance and another 100 ohm resistor in series is 200 ohms. You have two inductors. You put them in series, they add up, uh, you know, um, but if you put them in parallel, it gets a little more complicated. So you have 200 ohm resistors in parallel. You got to add the inverses of them. If you have two of them, it's pretty simple. 100 and 100, it gives you a 50. You start having three, four, or you start getting, you know, capacitors. It well, not in inductors. It gets a little more complicated. So hence my yuck. You know, you know, it starts getting hairy pretty quickly. So. The other way to add things in parallel is to add their emittances. So that's what the, the the nice thing about an emittance is. If you know the emittance of your component, then you can simply add add them together, just like you do in series. If you know their emittances and they're in parallel, you can add them together as well. So it simplifies things if you know the emittance. All right. So now just a quick review of, of uh, the Smith chart. Smith chart was invented by this guy, uh, Philip Smith. And the e- so some of the nice features about it, it easily converts impedances into emittances. And you'll find out on the Smith chart, a lot of this can be done fully graphically with a straight edge, a compass, a square. It's, it's, it's an amazing uh, thing he came up with. Um, it allows us to solve a lot of impedance matching using graphical methods instead of any complex math- mathematics. But what is really nice, it's really useful for visualizing where impedances lie um, in the domain and, and how, to, how, they cha- how the SWR changes over frequency ranges. So I was searching on the web to try to find some good information on Smith charts that I could present. And I, I came across our old friend, Alan, W2AEW, and I contacted him. He's got a really nice... Um, set of slides, a PDF file. And I'm going to, I'm going to still really fast through some of his slides. I got his permission to do that. He also has a video. Um, his video is about a half an hour where he goes over the same set of slides. So if you see something in here that tweaks your interest or you want to get a more in-depth information on Smith charts, I highly recommend you go to his YouTube channel and watch And You guys know him. He does some really, really nice uh, presentations. So here's his his slides. Um, again, I have his permission to go through these. So um, he presented this as a as a technical coordinator to ARRL. So down here in the bottom, this is the Smith chart. If you guys haven't ever seen it before, and what it looks like, 
And as I kind of mentioned, it, it's a graphical tool to plot and compute complexes, impedances, transmission line effects, and lets you to do matching networks and more. And again, this, I'm not here to, to teach you how to use this, but I just want to go over some of the things it can do and, and how it can look like it can be complex at times. One of the big things to, to note when you're using a Smith chart on paper is that a Smith chart is, is normalized. So no matter what your nominal impedance is, and for us hams, it's normally 50 ohms, that you need to convert everything to be normalized. So what's that mean? You need to divide everything by 50 so that it can be useful on the paper chart. And here he gives a couple examples on, you know, simply taking you have a Z of 37 to J55, you got to divide it by 50. Now you have a Z naught and it's a normalized. And this is then is what you plot. So you'll see Z naughts a lot through this presentation just because it's normalized. Okay, this is a, a very important slide here. So on your Smith chart, you have these regions. And it's divided by this line through the center. And this is a purely resistive line. So if you have a pure resistor with no inductance, no incapacitance, it'll lie on this line. Everything above that line is an inductor and indu has inductive properties. Anything below it has capacitive properties. And for my introduction, the J, you know, positive J is inductive, negative J is capacitive. In the center of the chart, we have Z naught, right? So that's the normalized point. And you see, if you can read it there, it says 1.0. Since it's normalized, that's our 50, for us hams, that's our 50 ohm point right there. On this side here, we have an open circuit. And then on this side here, we have a closed circuit. So as you moved along this line, if you could read it, it says one, like here's 0.5, here's 0.2. And here would be zero and going the other way. I'm sorry, is open circuit. I'm trying to read it. I'll point one and then open. And then the other direction goes to zero. Okay. And here he's just showing you have on the chart, you have circles here that are all tangent to the open here on the open side. And these are co called constant radius circles. So anywhere on this, on these circles, these red lines, so represented on all Smith charts, would be a red line, and those are constant radius. So no matter if you're up here in the inductive zone, you're, if you follow that curve, your resistance is going to change. And so that, those are called constant radius circles. You also have what are called constant arcs here. You have reactance arcs. On the top side, any arc on these arcing lines, these are constant inductance lines. So no matter where you are on that line, your inductor value is going to be the same. Now, likewise, on the mirror side down below, you have constant capacitance lines. So no matter where you are on this line, your constant capacitance. What's nice about a Smith chart as opposed to a rectangular chart, no matter what impedance number you can come with, up with, any number, it can be plotted on the chart. Whereas with a rectangular chart, you know, you have to keep expanding your, uh, your axes possibly, you know, out to infinity to get all points. But any point can be plotted. So here he's showing we have a Z25 plus J40. First, you normalize it. Now you got your Z naught. And then you can go along this axis, you find where we have 0 0.5. So that's our arc there. So you draw a line and then you find the 0.8, the J.8 is on the outside. You find it, come down, they intersect, and there's our point. Okay, so now if you have a point, you want to add a series element. You're adding series elements. So series elements, you're always going to follow these constant resistance lines. So no matter where your point starts at, and here's where we started, if you add series inductance, you're going to go up clockwise and follow that line around. And how much do you go? Well, it depends on how much inductance you added. And there's a, there's a scale on the outside of this graph that tells you how far you're going to transverse. And so that's where you'd end up. If you're adding capacitance, you're going the other direction. But you're, the, the key takeaway here 
is in series, you're following the red lines. You're either going inductively or you're going capacitively, but you're following a constant resistance circle. Okay, what about emittance? So this is where we're doing, it's the inverse. So the mittens is the inverse of reactants. It's not simply the resistant, you know, one over R plus one, plus or minus one over X, because that only happens when we have zero for the real component. So it gets a little, a little hairier to do an inverse of the emittance. It's, it's more than simply taking each piece and doing an inverse, but you can do it graphically on this wonderful chart. So here you have our Z, which is real easy to plot. We just, we just saw you find your resistance, you find your inductance, you put your mark. Well, the way to convert it to a Y is you put your compass on the center, you draw a circle around your center point here, our Z naught. You draw a line through our point, through that center to where it intersects the circle, and you can read off on this piece of paper, and that's your Y. So it's it's the one of the features of a chart, so one of the things you can do with it is easily convert Zs to Ys in this graphical manner. Mittens curves are also on, on it. If you have a nice Smith chart, not only does this display the, um, the actance, I'm sorry, the impedance, uh, impedance information, it also displays admittances. And those are done in these light blues. So we have the red, which is all impedances and the emittances are all in blue. So just like on, we had constant resistance circles over here in red, we have constant conductance circles in blue and we have constant subsistence arcs in red as well. So now if you're adding, just like when we added in series, we followed the red lines if we're adding in parallel, we follow the blue lines. So here we're adding parallel um, admittance, I'm sorry, parallel <laughs> substance, substances. So we're going up, and here we're adding capacitance, so we're going down. Okay, this is, a, this is an important one to look at here. So if you're adding... If we're adding inductors, we're always going, he calls it elevating. This is a, his little trick for remembering this. So if you're adding inductances in series, we're, following, we're going through the red lines and we're going up. If we're adding series capacitance, we're on the red lines going down. So adding inductors going up, capacitors, we're crashing down. If we're doing it in parallel, we're adding inductors. So the same thing, we're elevating up following the blue lines. If we're adding parallel capacitors, we're crashing down following the blue lines. And we'll, we're going to be revisiting this over and over and over again. This is the, our first introduction on trying to remember which way we're going. Another nice thing about this, the Smith chart is it allows you to convert from your or emittance or, or uh, impedances to things like SWR return loss by taking a compass, putting our point, swinging our compass around till it intersects the real line, using a square, dropping down at the bottom of the chart, there's these scales down here, which give us the SWR, gives us return loss, reflection coefficient, all these numbers you can get off of this chart. So again, this, the chart is an amazing tool it's just incredible, but you can see there's a lot of stuff you can do, and it's a lot you have to remember to use it. It can also figure out if you're measuring your impedance and you want to know what it is at some point along the transmission line, you can draw a circle around moving towards the generator. And each one of these, so one loop around this thing is a half a wavelength on, the, on a coax line, if you want to think. And then your impedances repeat on your coax line. So if you're moving, you know, uh, half, uh, I mean, uh, a fraction of a, a wavelength around the circle, you might end up here. So that might be the impedance at your load.
So here he's showing an example. So let's say, you know, you measured this, rotate towards the load to find it. So this here, you measured at the shack, you measured some impedance, and now he's rotating towards the load, whatever degree, to, you know, and, and how far do you rotate? Well, it depends on what your coax length was and your velocity factor. And on the outs again, on the outside of this chart, you can't see it here, but there's um, these out the very far on the outside are, are degree marks. So these are wavelengths. And here you can see on this, oh, he's highlighted it here, wavelengths towards the load. You go in this way, he's got a little arrow here. And here's wavelengths towards the generator. So if you're going towards the generator, you're going this way. Towards the load, you're going this way, and around the outside are, are degrees. You can see here it's 0 0.025, so it's a quarter wavelength. This is uh, talking about there's some how you do a little bit of matching. And now he goes into giving an example and how you how you go through the design process, how you you start out with your <laughs> With your thing, you normalize it, you figure out how you want to do it, you do some deltas, you figure out what you want to go. So here is a further example, this, normalize, plot it, pick a topology. I'm going to go really fast through all this. You rotate some mechanism till you hit a circle. You do some math here, you convert, but you know, you translate between uh, J's based on the frequency, you get how many nano Henry's you need to add this component. Now you go in this direction, da, blah, 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 blah. It just, you know, you can see <laughs> it does a lot, but it's a lot to remember. It's, it's, uh, it's a beautiful tool. I highly, highly recommend you study it and learn the background on it, but I'm not going to go through all the details on how you work with a Smith chart. So in summary, it's highly useful. It does all this stuff. And in the end, look what he says. Check out SimSmith <laughs> because this is a great tool that we're going to learn about. And like I said, it's going to help us understand a little bit of that stuff we just fl flew through. And hopefully by the end of this, you might start to get an intuitive feel on how you move around in the Smith chart without having to go through all that math and try to remember all the technical graphical methods that you have to do to make it useful. Okay. So Inner Simsmith. It's written by this guy, um, a, uh, Ward, AE6TR. And he wrote in his own words, it was an exploration in filters um, and, and his learning about matching impedances. It's a Java based tool. So I think it'll, I've run it on Windows, but it should run on uh, Linux for Don or Apple's for you Apple folks out there. It's got a pretty extensive user manual, it's, it's pretty decent. So my way to think about this is, to me, it's like a slide ruler, right? A slide rule was an incredible tool. I learned how to do, use it way back when. I can probably still do uh, pluses, minuses, multiplications on it maybe, and it does all this other stuff. But unless you use it all the time, it's hard to remember how to use it. To me, it's the, kind of the same thing with, with a Smith chart. It's amazing what that chart will do. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's magic. But unless you use it all the time, it's really hard to remember it all. So to me, it's like a calculator is to a Smith is to a slide rule what Sim Smith is to the chart. It automates all that stuff, and and the fundamentals are there. But it just makes it so much easier. It makes it almost fun. Nay, it is fun. It, it's a lot of fun actually. <laughs> okay, so Alan uh, suggests this video. So this is like a three and a half minute video. And I'd like to, to play that to, as an introduction in his own words. He plays. SimSmith is the most comprehensive Smith chart software Good. available today. It provides four basic functions, a schematic editor, the ability to characterize components using files if appropriate, a Smith chart for displaying impedances, and a square chart for displaying SWR, power, and waveforms. 
SimSmith circuits are constructed using the familiar drag and drop paradigm. Basic components are characterized using traditional parameters such as inductance and Q. Components can be characterized more precisely using impedance files. SimSmith circuit analysis can display the impedance transformation of the circuit at a given frequency, as seen here, or across a range of frequencies, as seen here. The two plots can be combined. Circuit analysis is performed continuously. This provides immediate feedback to the designer. Component values may be manipulated directly by editing their values, or through a drag and drop paradigm. SimSmith allows the design of custom circuit elements. These elements can have any connectivity. So SimSmith circuits are not limited to ladder circuits. The SimSmith square chart can be used to display SWR charts or power and can also be used to display waveforms. The waveforms need not be purely sinusoidal. SimSmith exposes its internal programming language. This allows a user to automate practices and test scenarios. This allows the user to write custom plotting routines which add insight to complex design interactions. In short, SimSmith provides a highly interactive design environment. The computer provides the circuit analysis and graphing functions, while the user provides the creativity and insight necessary to achieve the desired goal. Okay, so I hope that was um, a good introduction. I thought it was a pretty good introduction. Um, so we're just going to cover the really simple stuff. And again, focusing on impedance matching. But you can see um, there's a whole uh, language. Um, you can do um, all kinds of uh, custom blocks and, and just some amazing thing the stuff you can do. 11.5. So the cir circuit model up in the left-hand corner, um, I think you saw in his presentation. So up in this corner here is the circuit model itself. Um, there's a couple of nice uh, things to the note here. Um, first off, underneath the elements, it'll tell you on the on any component you drop in here, it'll have what the resistive value is of that component, the reactive value of that component, and you can, this will display several different things. We'll just leave it here, but it shows the amount of power that's being delivered into that element. Um, on the generator, it'll show what the SWR it's seeing. This is the um, um, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> uh, reflection coefficient. And then underneath those are tuning parameters. So here I've got it currently set to where our generator is generating a 14 megahertz signal. Our Z naught is 50 ohms. Um, I've set the, it's a voltage source and it's one watt uh, develop, um, output right now. And I've got our load, load set to 50 ohms, uh, pure resistive. There's no reactive component at the moment. Okay, on the Smith chart side, um, this is what we looked at a minute ago with the, um, the paper one. So, again, we have the X equals zero here. We have R zero short on the left. So this is the shorted zero. 
And then on this side, we've got uh, infinite or open. And you can see here, so our chart is 50 ohms is our nominal. So instead of being one here, it actually tells us it's 50 ohms. And you can see it's increasing 100 ohms, 250, and then infinite over here and going the other direction, 25 ohms, 10 ohms, and short circuit. And then here are our red circles, our constant resistive circles. This dot here, I can click anywhere on the chart and put that dot. So it's nice. So you can see and down here in the bottom corner, you can see the SWR of where I've clicked. And the, here's the Z. So, again, if I click on the center, you can see Z is 50 ohms with no reactants. If I come on this circle, let's say I click here and I'm on that circle. 50 ohms plus some negative J, so we're capacitive because we're on the bottom, right? If I went, if I follow this circle around, constant circle going through, this is the magical circle because this is the constant 50 ohm circle. If I come up here, let's say about right, I'm going to take a guess right here. Now we're at uh, 50 ohms still because I stayed on that circle. We're plus J70, so I'm inductive and about the same as I was down here capacitive. Okay, likewise, we got the blue. These are the constant conductance. And here's the, the magical one is the one that intersects our 50 ohm. So that's our unity, sometimes referred to as the unity conductance circle. And then we have the constants of substance arcs. Okay, so to me, again, the Smith, Sim Smith is, is a nice tool to help us understand the charts, them, Smith charts themselves, to help us to understand the effects of lump impedances and a tool for understanding how coax affects our, our loads um, and uh, the transformation of our load impedance as we move towards, towards our gener generator. So I thought what I would do is we'd do some experiments here. So... Let's, so we have our load up here, and we have our generator, and then down here are our symbols. And this lower, these are our ladder logic pieces that we can we can drop in. And this piece here is a transmission line. All right, so if I drop a transmission line between our load and our generator, we can see that um, first off, the the coax length here is defined here, and no matter what I put here, if we look on the Smith chart our impedance stays right in the center, right? And so we know, or, or we know it's not changing our impedance because we're a, we're a perfect 50 ohms right now. So it's no matter where I put the length of that coax, it doesn't affect anything. Um, now, I can also add in here a lumped, let me get rid of this a minute. Let's add, add in a capacitor. So, I'm adding in a series capacitor. And if you remember before, when we were talking about series, we're, we're, right now we're sitting here at the center. If I add a series capacitor, what's it going to do? Right? It's going to crash. He's, um, Alan said crash. Remember crash. It's series, so we're following red line. So if I put a capacitor in here, we should, we should crash from here following a red line down. And indeed, that's what happens. So you can see what our load is seeing here has been trans, transfer, transformed from our center because of that capacitor. Now we're down here in capacitive region. Right? From what we talked about earlier, if we add an inductor in series, again, it's going to follow the constant re, uh, resistance circles, and it's going to elevate. Inductor L, elevate. So if I put an inductor in here, indeed, we can see it elevated us up. And depending on the amount of inductance, depends on how far. You can see how it's following over here. It's following, as I change the value, it's following that constant resistance circle. Circuit, circle. Okay, likewise, if you add a parallel, so when we talked about parallel, here's our constant conductance circles. If we add a parallel capacitor, capacitor crash, so we're going down. We're going down on the subsistence line. I'm sorry, conductance. I'm going down on the conductance lines. So I drop that in. You can see here we've crashed down following a constant conductance. 
And if I put it, an inductor in, we talked about inductors elevate, inductance L is the representation L, and it elevates. Parallel, it's following blue line. So I put that in here, you'll see. Indeed, we've elevated. And again, by changing the amount of inductance, you know, moves us along that circle, just a nice, con follows the contour of, the, of that circle. Okay, so now let's make it a little more interesting. Let's um, make it so our load is not purely resistive, right? We're not, right now we're sitting at the center. So let's move it off center a minute by making this a capacitive load. So I can just get this and I can just drag our load. Let's just drop it, let's say down in here somewhere. All right, so now we're or on the bottom side, so we're capacitive. And you can see here a couple of things. We can see our resistance now is 40.6. And how, how do we see that on the chart? Well, here's again, the, our circle. So we got 25 ohms is here. 50 ohms is here, so we're kind of in between. So, yeah, 40.6 looks about right. Um, X is negative, so we're capacitive. The other thing to look at here is our, our power. Our power has dropped to 0.7 um, watts delivered. So we've because of our SWR not being good, we're not getting a good power transfer. Let's add a piece of coax in here. So now we can see that the coax has transformed our impedance. And what's it transferred it to? It went from 40 minus 57 to 15 minus 9. All right, so it's, it's transformed our impedance. Um, notice that it hasn't affected our SWR, though. No matter what this length is, our SWR is going to, it's going to change the same. So he, this little number down here in the bottom, you can put an SWR circle on here. That is a constant SWR circle. So anywhere on that circle, I just set it to two, an SWR two to one. Anything on that circle is going to be an SWR two to one that our load will be seeing. Right now, you can see our load is seeing an SWR 3.3. So it's outside that circle. Let me do this. Let me set this to 3.3. All right, so you can see that our load now has moved along because of that coax length, but the SWR hasn't changed. Let's go ahead and start increasing the length of our coax. The SWR doesn't change, but the reactance is, right? So we've gone from down here where our reactance was capacitive as we added, we've added coax, now we're inductive. We're on the top side of a chart. And it just keeps going around and around and starts repeating itself. Also notice it's spiraling in. Why is it spiraling in? Well, because our coax has loss. So as we're going around and around, we're starting to lose more and more power. You can see over here, our power delivered to our load now is down to 0.6. If I, if I keep going longer and lower coax, let's go 180 feet. Now we're down to 0.5. All right, so you can see how the coax is, is chewing up our, our power. Okay, so I thought what I would do now is to, to show us some mashing that we can do. And to do this, I'm gonna, I did a study a couple of years ago on something, an antenna called an extended double zep antenna. So I figured I'd use that as a, a good example on how to match stuff. So we'll look at what a double zep is, look at some properties from the model, and then review how we can do some matching with it. So this is a, an extended double zep. And I have a reference here. This W5JH has a really good paper. It was in QST um, 10, 10, 15 years ago. But what it is, it's a, it's a, a long wire. It's, it's 1.25 wavelengths long, center fed, and the typical deployment uses a ladder line matching section to get it to 50 ohms back to the shack. Because at the feed point up here, and I'm going to call this the feed point, it's a very um, reactive. It's a, a big capacitive load up here. So this ladder line should, in theory, get us to uh, 50 ohms with no reactants. 
and here's a plot of what this uh, what this antenna will do. It, normally, it has um, a decent amount of gain over a dipole, which is why I was interested in looking at it. Okay, so what I did was I modeled it in uh, Easy Neck, and we're going to be playing with it at 14 megahertz. I've got it half a, a wavelength high. Here's the SWR plot, and you can see their SWR is very, very high. It's uh, 63.1 to 1. And the impedance is uh, 89.7R minus J522 almost. So, again, very, very uh, capacitive load. Here's what the, uh, the current on the wire looks like, uh, the radiation patterns. And my model is matching what, uh, what the paper said. So I feel pretty good that the model is, is correct. My impedance is matched what the what the what the paper had. Okay, so get rid of our coax. So we've we've got a blank file. So one of the nice things you can do is we can put in the right here, we can put in what we saw. We had basically 90, and we had minus 522. So here's our point. All right, so if I put the point and I click on it, you can see down here is our SWR of roughly six, 63. So that kind of matches up. But one of the really nice things with, um, with SimSmith is, is rather than typing that in like I just did, you can actually select a file. So um, EasyNeck uh, puts out an impedance file. And that is this file here. So I can just pull that file in directly. And it has all the impedances over that sweep that I did. You can also bring in uh, S12 parameters, touchstone files. Like if you have a nano VNA or something that makes touchstone files, you can also bring those in. So if you have an antenna model now, which we have, this, our load now is, is uh, matching what our model has predicted over a frequency range. Um, let's see. So... We can see here the power delivered to our load is less than 62 uh, milli, milliwatts. I can change, let me change this to 100. I can put in here 100 watts. So we get, we're getting six watts into our load from a 100 watt transmitter. So clearly, we, clearly we need to do some matching. <laughs> I can also look, here's the SWR plot. Let's see, what am I looking at? SWR doesn't. SWR looks too good. <laughs> I'm confused for a minute. Give me a second. Uh, let me think here. Okay. There we go. There we go. There's the SWR chart. So, again, this is what we saw from Easy Neck. So, this is on our rectangular plot. Our SWR is 63 to one, and our load is uh, very reactive. All right, so how do we fix this? So in the, in the paper, it said to add a uh, piece of feed line, open ladder. So let's do, let's do what the paper says. So we can go down here and take our feed line, we drop it in, we can specify the parameters for the feed line or any, or any piece of feed line we want. Well, they've got this huge library of all these different types of coax and feed lines in here. So one of them is a generic 450 open window line. So I can select that. You can already see it, it moved our point here from our, our model, moved it along, and now we're here. So I can start increasing this length. So now we're, we're here. So 
Our impedance now is 38 minus J.15. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good, pretty good load. If I put our circle at SWR 1.5 to 1, that looks pretty, pretty decent. We can look out on the SWR chart now. Right, SWR came down from 61 or 63 down to, you know, 1 to 3.5 on the, the upper end of 40. So the other thing we can do, so we can, so on the Smith chart here, we're showing the transformation path that this coax gave us. We can also sweep it over the frequency range. So here, now what I've done now, if I switch from what the transformation was to sweeping from 13 megahertz to 15 megahertz. So this is coming out of the easy neck file that I generated. Um, let's make it a little smaller. I can also sweep, you can specify. So I'm going to sweep from 14 megahertz to 14.35 megahertz. So what our load is seeing, what well, I'm sorry, what our transmitter is seeing is this arc. So it's seeing our SWR from, from here of 1.3 to 14.08, we're within 1.5 SWR. Our load went from here to here over that range. <laughs> So immediately I can see, well, I don't really like this match that much. So I can go over here to my transmission line and I can adjust the length of that, that feed line. Let's say I want to center it here. So with using 8.2 feet of window line, now I'm in this range. My SWR looks like this over that range. So that's, you know, that's probably, I can maybe deal with this. Let's see, I can... Changes. Yeah, trying to get a more detail. Okay, there we go. So, you know, maybe that's an acceptable solution for the Santana for, for what you're trying to do. Okay, the next thing we can do, this is where things get a little more interesting, perhaps, is we can match it using uh, coax stubs. So the general principle of, of matching this is <clears throat> what you want to do is insert your stub at the place where you're, so you're going to, you're inserting transmit, you're going to insert a, a series transmission line. You're going to put your transmission line on. You're going to find out where you're tran along your transmission line. You're going to intersect. I'll call them these magical circles. So the first circle that we're interested in is the constant unity resistance circle. The other circle of magic is the constant conductive conductance circle of unity. So that's these two circles. This blue one's the constant conductance unity circle. Again, they intersect our nominal impedance. And then the resistance one, again, the magical one is the one, the unity one is the one that intersects our nominal impedance. So as I add coax to our model, so we'll say I add a piece of coax in here, and we'll add, we'll make it um, RG, uh, RG, what, RG8X, let's say. We look at the path. So here's the path. So I've already, I've, by adding that piece of coax in there, I've moved our impedance from where it was with no matching down to here. So if I add, keep adding coax, you can see we're going around and around until I get a full half wave and I end up back where I started minus loss, right? So that's a full half wave of coax between my load and my transmitter. During that revolution, we've crossed the these two important circles four times. We crossed it here on the constant reactant, uh, constant resistance circle. We keep getting along the coax further and further, heading towards the transmitter. 
We hit here. This is our constant conductance circle. We hit it there. We keep going. We hit it again here. We keep going way, way over here. We hit it again up here. And that's what I've marked here with these, tried to mark with these arrows. So these are the four places where we can consider placing the stubs before this whole sequence repeats again. So the first place where we get the first intersection is here, and that is at 8.6 uh, meters. Um, currently, I'm in feet, so SimSmith will let you set your units. So I'm going to switch to meters. You can also go inches, centimeters, feet, back to meters. So we'll go with meters. And what did I say? That can't be eight meters. What's it doing? Must be point eight. What's not even that? Okay, there we enter. So here's our first point. So, and I can zoom in on this if I wanted to. Okay, so you can see here we've intersected this constant resistance circle. Okay, so how are we going to get from this point to where we want it? This is our target here, right? That's our target. Nominal 50 ohms with no with no uh, reactants. So we want to get here. So we want to go, we want to raise up. We want to go this way around the constant resistance circle. So we're on, we want to go on a red line. <laughs> so that's a series. So we're going to want to add some sort of series element in here. Okay, and it wants to be an inductor because we want to raise up. So if you remember, I thought I had a slide in here, but uh, an inductor for coax, um, a shorted coax less than half a wavelength acts like an inductor. So if I take a, a shorted piece of coax and I drop, drop it in here, what happened? Go RGAX. No, so oh, that's, that's yep, parallel. Yep. That's not series. <laughs> uh, I'm in, I, I was putting in a parallel. This is a series inductor, right? And so it's a series shorted, acts like an inductor. And you can see here I've started moving. So there it goes. And then, again, SimSmith allows you to this drag and drop that he was talking about. So I can fine-tune this by just pulling this point over drop it on our center, and there's a solution. So if we added a short piece of coax from our antenna that's 0.17 meters long, and then we added a series shorted piece of coax stub, that puts that matches us right away. All right, so that, that's one possible solution. Um, let's see, the next possible solution is to continue along adding coax until we intersect this line. Okay, now we want to come up on the constant conductance circle. So we want to raise up. Well, let's, let's do, let's do this first. Let me go all the way around to the other solution on the, over the here. And we'll, we'll stick with series for a minute because I want, I'm going to go on the red line again, right? So now you can see before we came up here, now we want to crash down on this red line. And remember what Alan's trick is, crash down means capacitive. We're, we're going on a constant resistive circle. So that means a series element. So that means we want to add a, a piece of open coax in series less than half a wavelength. That acts, acts like a capacitor. So if I drop that in here, 
sure enough, you can see we're starting to move along that circle. All right, so there's our second, that's our second of four solutions. Both of those are series solutions. We've added series stubs. Has anybody tried to put a series stub in a piece of coax? <laughs> it's not real easy. So it's series been done, stubs, but it's tough. Yeah, it's not it's not a great way to go. <laughs> you have to um, use a T T adapter. <laughs> well, for a T would be good for, for parallel, right? But um yeah. you know, if you had ladder line, it would work pretty you could do this. So let's let's look at the other solutions. Oh, here's my, my cheat sheet. So an open stub less than half a wavelength, uh, half a, um, yeah, is capacitive greater than on a shorted stub is inductive. So that's our, our two uh, rules to keep in mind. 90 degrees is a quarter wave for your information. I'm sorry, Court. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so I just did the two series solutions here. So now let's uh, move on to the to the parallel solutions. Okay, so if we back our, our coax back, the first one here on the constant conductance. So now we're going to concentrate on these blue constant conductance lines because we're talking parallel. So the first solution will be this first intersection at 3.6 meters, and I want to raise up. I want to elevate up on this circle. So elevate up means inductance again. Inductance is a shorted piece of coax, less than a quarter wavelength. So I drop that in there. You can see it's now moving along this arc here. And there, we've matched it using a, a parallel stub. All right, so that's, what, that's the next solution we've got. And then the final solution using stubs is we keep coming a little, little longer down the transmission line till we hit, again, the unity conductance circle. And now we're going to want to crash down because we're coming down through this, down on the circle. So that means implies by Alan's little trick of the mind is capacitance. We're crashing. We're on a blue, so that's parallel stuff. So we're doing a parallel. So here's an open piece of coax. Drop it in parallel. And we can see there's our solution. All these solutions, when I looked at them, so right now we're looking at the this path, we're showing the path, but what about over the frequency range that we did this? So if we switch this to, to do a sweep, this is how the transformation looks over the frequency range of 14 megahertz to 14.35 megahertz down here. Let's put an SWR circle, two to one. There's a two to one solution. So for two to one solution in the center, at 14 megahertz, we're about one to one. By the time we leave the two to one SWR, we're at 14.12. And then from 14.12 to 14.35 over here, we're outside that. Well, maybe we could tweak these lengths a little bit. So now we're between SWR of 14.09, 14.33. Maybe that's better for your operating range. So the takeaway from that is I think you can see it's pretty easy to graphically just sort of pull things along, adjust the lengths, adjust where your match is going to be over the frequency sweep range, range you choose. You can tweak your lengths. And uh, I think it's a, a nice way to – evaluate your stubs or design your stubs. Okay, the next thing we might want to be interested in doing is instead of using stubs, what about doing uh, fixed lumped 
um, com- components to make our, our, our circuits. And we can do that using the standard um, L networks, which are typically comprised of a capacitor and inductor, one of them in series and one in parallel. So here you see four different L networks that we can do with a capacitor and an inductor. There's four possible technologies. Um, so each one of these can only transform our impedance over a given region. There's regions that you can't re- you can't get to the center from. So, and those are called forbidden regions. And each one of these circuits has its own forbidden region. For instance, this one here, if you're in this lighter area, anywhere in here, if you use this circuit, you can transform and get to our center, our, our target. But if you're in the forbidden region, no matter what values you pick, you cannot get from this region to our, our target. There's no way to do it. Likewise for these other, these other three. In addition to these, there's also capacitor-capacitor networks or L networks and inductor-inductor L networks, which I'll, we can see on the next slide. One thing I did want to point out here is a lot of times when you're doing research or you're looking at these um, depictions of, of uh, networks, even on Smith chart tutorials or whatever, they'll have the load on the right and the source with the generator, transmitter on the left, antenna on the right. Smith chart does it the other way. So um, if you're looking at this and you get confused, you just uh, check yourself and make sure you're thinking about which side is, is what in the topology. Here's another depiction of the uh, of the Smith chart regions. I wanted to put this one on here because it depicts it slightly different and it also includes the uh, the two inductor regions. So for instance, um, if you're in this region here and you want to get to that center, you can use a type A or a type C. So you could pick this as your matching network or you could pick this as your matching network depending on your characteristics of, uh, you know, one of these is going to be a, a um, low pass and the other will be a high pass solution. Might not matter if we're just matching an antenna, but if you're doing a circuit, you know, you're coming out and you're matching to an audio board or something, you might want to use a low pass. If you're going to, uh, you know, an RF amplifier, you might want to use a high pass. Here's this region four down here. It looks like kind of a cat smiley cat face or something that matches with G and H. So these two regions, uh, sorry, is the region, the G and H will match down here. Capacitive, if these were capacitors, they would match this region three. Um, They're not depicted here either. Okay. So for our load, um, I put a green dot on, uh, on our chart where we are. So these are our two networks that would match. Okay, so we're back. I'll do the path. Um, okay, so the first one was showing a, an inductor next to our transfer. So if I put it, drop it. So the first solution is we're going to come down and meet. Um, let's see, put an inductor in parallel. So we're going to swing around and hit that first line. So we do this. Down, so inductor meets. So I added an inductor. We followed in parallel, so we followed a blue line, which isn't printed on our chart, but we followed a circle until we hit the constant resistive line. And now we're going to follow that, and that's going to follow a red line, to follow a resistance line. We use a series component, right? And it needs to be, we're crashing down, so it's a capacitor. Drop that in there. You can see so there's one of our solutions. Okay, and the other solution is to add a capacitor first. And then what we're, what we're trying to do here is now we're crashing down. We're parallel, so we're on the conductance lines until we hit the unity circle of resistance, which is here. So we've gone way past it. So let's we'll bring it back. I 
And then we add an inductor in series to follow. So we're, now we want to follow the constant resistance line. We're elevating, so that's an inductor. And there's our next solution. And we can look at the SWR on that as well. So that's our two to one. So that's what our solution gave us. And we could, again, just like we did before, we can adjust our components, maybe to center that up a little bit to where we, where we like it. There are SWR charts here. We can look at the power that's being delivered. There's our power being delivered. So we can also do, um, you know, in addition to L networks, we can do uh, three elements in here. So this one here really doesn't bias a whole lot over our, our first solution. It looks almost identical. This one here is interesting. So we have a T network here, uh, a inductor, capacitor, inductor network. And what's nice about this is it, um, it's, it, it, it keeps the Q down uh, closer to within a, a Q of one. I won't take the time to show it, but um, that's one of the advantages of that particular circuit. Okay, so that's that's some of the basics of uh, of, of matching. And I hope um, if you get to play with this, I think if you play with it a little bit, you'll see it, it gives you a real intuitive feel for how to match stuff. And I think, you know, once you do that, you have a piece of paper or you look at your nano VNA and you'll see where your load is when you look at it, you can pretty much instinctively, after you play with this, it's like a video game, you'll say, oh, I know exactly how to match that. I mean, it just becomes intuitive after you play with it a little bit. Um, it's, it's really a great teaching tool, I find, personally. Because the next thing, let's say you've, you, you've, you've deployed your antenna, it's up in the air, you think it's good, you've got your coax run into the shack, you stick your nano via in it, it tells you what the SWR is. You know the SWR is correct, because we saw SWR doesn't change with coax length, but what is the actual feed point impedance? Well, there's a couple ways you can do that. If you, um, if you were good and you had your coax before you drug your antenna up in the trees, a lot of things like the nano VNA, um, I think the, the rig expert, you can calibrate them uh, to the end of your coax. So now you're good. Once the antenna's up in the air, your, your uh, rig expert, your nano VNA will tell you what the impedance is up there in the air. Um, but the problem is you got to keep that all around as a reference. Well, the, the alternative is if you know what your coax length is and the velocity factor ahead of time, and you keep that, you keep a record of that. Um, at any point in time, you can measure in your shack and then back out the length of the coax. And you can do that with a Smith chart, uh, with a Smith chart pretty easily. And Alan touched on it in one of the slides, but you can also do it really easily with uh, SimSmith. So for this one here, I'm going to uh, pick, I had a delta loop I made. Um, delta loop measured. So I put a delta loop up for 10 megahertz, 30 meters. And I measured it in the shack. And this is what, um, what I got in the shack. So this is, uh, see, I got the two to one SWR circle here. So I'm, on, I'm better than two to one my SWR curve looked like this. So obviously it wasn't real good. I have since then fixed it. It's a little better than it was, but so my resident in the shack, it's saying 9.9 .9 was my best SWR. Uh, SimSmith, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but there's these color bands. So it'll actually put a color band on the ham radio uh, frequencies, which is, which is kind of nice. Um, there's my, my power being delivered. So if I put an X here, my power at 10.12, I'm getting 93. Um, well, that's not actually true because this, <laughs> this is measured in the shack and I got no coax. So, okay, so, what, so how do I know what's out at my actual antenna? Because, again, this is what I measured in the shack. What I can do is take a transmission line, drop it in here. I know in this particular case it was RG... 58U or CU is what I ran. And I had a hundred, I had a hundred feet of it.
So what I can do is here is I can put a minus 100 feet. And that actually subtracts out my coax. So my actual impedance is this now uh, blue line is what the generator is, is seeing. So this is the what I measured in the shack. And this is what it is up there in the air where I can't get my, my hands on. So I think that's a, a pretty handy a handy feature to have. Um, I mean, I've often experienced that. You're in the shack and you're trying to remember what it is up there in the air. So if you have your coax length, you know what your velocity factor is, um, you can always back it out really easy using SimSmith. It's pretty handy for that. Okay. The last thing I wanted to talk about was evaluating uh, coax uh, stubs. So we've often talked about this for field day. You know, what can stubs do for us? Um, are they, are they going to help us at all for various situations? So I thought I would just demonstrate um, the value of a stub. And I, I picked here to look at um, a 40 meter, 40 meter stub. So let me uh, get rid of this. We'll get rid of this load here and we'll just put in here an ideal load. So we're sitting here in field day. We have a perfect antenna hooked up to our transmitter. So let's say we want to filter out. Um, we want to pass 40 and 15 and null out 20 and, and 10. So from that prior chart, let me go back to that a minute. So I got this off of uh, a, a website here. I gave him credit. But this is the one we're going to implement. A quarter wave length, 40 meters shorted stub is supposed to pass 40 and 15 and null out 10 and 20. So let's just evaluate that. All right, so he says drop in a quarter wave length, 40 meters, 40 meter stub. So... Okay, here's a, a shorted, shorted stub. I drop it in here. Um, let's see, forty a quarter wave. Let's see, so let's, we'll sweep. I'm trying to remember here. Give me a second. Uh, Fourteen megahertz. And. Sweep, let's sweep from, let's say, um, 3.5 to 30 megahertz. And let's see, a quarter wave, 14 megahertz. Somebody off the top of your head know what that is? Let's see. Four, six, eight. Go 16 up. point something feet. <laughs> Good job, Lee. 16.5 feet. Let's look at that. So there's the, um, okay, and I've got, let's put um, RG8X in there again. So is that what we got? So we're passing 40. Where's 40? 40 is, is in here. Now, this is good. I just adjusted the length. So, so based on the different coaxes, you're going to get different things. So I'm just going to show this. This is in. It's passing uh, 40. It's passing. This is uh, 15 meters. And we got a deep null here at 20 meters and 10 meters. So that stub is, is working quite nicely. So I think for field day, you know, we can look at, and it doesn't matter where we stick it. Let me just stick a random piece of coax, right? The, the, you know, where we put that stub, we want it close to the transmitter, All right? So there we go. All right. And so much more. <laughs> I didn't touch on it. So we just went over you know, some of the lump, we went over some of the various stubs you can put in transmission line. There's traps. There's all these other function blocks that, that it's just, it goes on and on. And here's a bunch of references. 
for Smith Shorts, um, how to match. Another one of Alan's excellent videos on matching, some stuff on the forbidden zones. And if anybody's interested in the double extended double zap, there's some information on that. And that's it. Oh, fantastic. My head's about to explode. <laughs> As I'm sure yours was going through all that.